All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar today to speak about the Family Forest Carbon Program. Uh, thanks for joining. Our goal today is to provide some high level information around the program to you and uh, discuss a little bit around next steps, how you could engage further if you're continuing interested and um, give an opportunity for some Q&A. So um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. You can drop those questions in the chat throughout the, uh, the meeting here, and uh, we'll have a space at the end for some Q&A to answer those. So you'll hear from a few uh, folks today. Myself, my name is Scott Martin. I'm the Senior Manager of Account Management here at FFCP. So my team supports landowners interested in enrolling to navigate the uh, enrollment process up until the point of enrollment in the program. You'll also hear from Ian Forte, our senior forestry manager in the Appalachia region, who will talk through our eligibility and our available practices in the region. And finally, you'll hear from Jasmine Brown, our senior manager of landowner stewardship, who will talk about uh, how to enroll and uh, what it looks like as part of our community and as part of an enrolled landowner um, after enrollment. And finally, wrap up, like I said, with some next steps and an opportunity for Q&A. So who are we? Who is the American Forest Foundation? What is the Family Forest Carbon Program and why do we offer it? So American Forest Foundation, or we refer to it as AFF often, is a national conservation nonprofit organization. And our mission is to empower family forest landowners like yourselves to make a meaningful conservation impact on your land. So we're here to support you. So why do we offer the Family Forest Carbon Program? Uh, about 40% of forest, forested land in the United States is owned by families and individuals who have a deep caring for their woods, the health of their woods, but often don't have either the funds, resources, or connections to access the full potential, realize the full potential of their property. So AFF offers the Family Forest Carbon Program as an opportunity uh, for landowners to benefit from the voluntary carbon market. Uh, while providing you with additional income from your land and bringing forest management support and resources to you that you may not otherwise have access to or knowledge of. Um, and the sustainable forest management practices that we encourage and implement uh, improve the long-term forest health and value of your forest while increasing the carbon sequestration and storage and benefit to the atmosphere. So, an important question we get a lot is how is AFF and how is the Family Forest Carbon Program funded? Uh, the answer is multiple. So first and foremost, we rely on the carbon market for funding. We aggregate the carbon benefit from our program and from our, our enrolled landowners um, to create carbon credits and to into agreements with organizations and corporations interested in reducing their carbon footprint and achieving their net zero ambitions. So that's our primary funding mechanism and our preferred funding mechanism. Uh, but beyond that, we do rely on a, a variety of grants and private donations as a nonprofit to fund both the foundation and FFCP. So you probably all come in here with varying degrees of knowledge of FFCP, what it is um, and what the goals are. Uh, but in simple terms, FFCP helps landowners with at least 30 forested acres reach your forest management goals by providing income, guidance from a forester, and a forest management plan, and a community of other like-minded individuals interested in improving their forests and benefiting from them. So the program improves forest health, as I mentioned. It improves wildlife habitat. It improves your timber value. And it also increases the carbon stored on the land. Um, which, of course, we turn into carbon credits, as I mentioned, which funds the program. So I want to talk a little bit more about carbon markets. Uh, it's a very complex industry, and it's a relatively new industry. So um, just to shine a light a little bit on the history of it, traditionally, it takes somewhere between five to 10,000 forested acres to make a carbon project financially viable. So obviously in most cases, most family forest landowners do not have five to 10,000 forested acres at their disposal. 
which historically has meant that the voluntary carbon market is relatively off limits to landowners like that. So AFF and the Nature Conservancy came together to create the Family Forest Carbon Program to unlock the carbon market to landowners like yourselves. We do that by aggregating, as I mentioned, the carbon benefit on each of your individual properties into a larger program benefit, which we can then provide to the carbon market in exchange for financing. So what does that mean for you, for landowners? First and foremost, guaranteed annual payments. Um, you'll know what those payments look like at the time of signing. You'll have a full 20 year schedule of payments. So you'll know exactly what to expect. Um, and an important question we receive a lot around payments is what happens if the market value, if the value of carbon changes in the next 20 years? We fully expect it to change in some way over the next 20 years. So first, what if the carbon value drops? What happens to my payments? Well, the, one of the main benefits of FFCP and the way that our model is created is that if the carbon value drops or doesn't increase to the rate that we anticipate, your payments are still guaranteed. So those payments are not going to decrease. They're not going to stop coming. We're going to keep paying you that number we agreed upon at the beginning. But also importantly, what if the carbon value increases? So our pricing model actually incorporates about a 3% year-over-year increase in carbon value throughout the 20-year contract term. So we already anticipate that that value is going to increase, and it has been increasing the last few years since we started the program. Now, if that value increases substantially more than we expected, one of the benefits of working with a nonprofit like us is that we don't have an interest in holding on to that extra profit. So if it does increase substantially, we'll find a way to pass that benefit on to our enrolled landowners, which is in line with the mission I mentioned a couple slides back. So before I pass it over to Ian, I just wanna talk a little bit more in depth about those benefits to you. First and foremost, as I mentioned, the financial benefits are always gonna be an important part of our program. I mentioned the guaranteed annual payments. That's unrestricted funding to you. We're writing a check to you and you get to use it however you want. It could go towards your property taxes or your mortgage. It could go towards land improvements or a new tractor, or it could just go towards taking your kids out to a nice dinner. Whatever you choose to use the, pro the uh, funding for is up to you. I will note it is uh, taxable income. It's unrestricted taxable income. So just wanna make that clear from the start. Uh, beyond that, healthier and more climate resistant forests improve long-term forest value. So one of the other benefits of our program, allowing your forest to become more mature, allows it to be more resilient to the impacts of climate change that we're already seeing, whether that be you know, droughts or heavy rains or um, other severe weather events, the healthier, the more mature your forest is, the more resilient it is to those things. And you do retain full ownership, privacy, and control of your property. So maybe you use it for hunting, maybe you hike on it, maybe you take pictures of birds, whatever you choose to do, whether personal or professionally, you maintain the right to do those things throughout the 20 year contract term. So beyond the finances, uh, we also provide, as I mentioned, forest management resources. First and foremost, one of the best resources we can provide is a forester, somebody educated in managing forests. Uh, they'll provide recommendations, expertise, connections to help you achieve your own personal forest management goals. And another way we do that is by providing a forest management plan. So Ian will talk a little bit more in depth about our forest management plans and how we provide them and how they can support you. But a couple important notes on FMPs is that they're created based on your goals. So it's not just a boilerplate FMP we give to everyone. The forester is gonna to talk to you about what you want to accomplish and they're gonna make recommendations in that plan based on those goals. Um, beyond that, we have a very wide variety of partners at AFF and FFCP. So we're always looking for ways to connect our enrolled landowners with additional partners to increase the width and breadth of the opportunities, education and resources you have at your disposal.
Now, the last one I want to mention is community benefits. Uh, first, you'll gain membership into a community of like-minded landowners like yourselves who share experiences, ideas, solutions uh, to various goals, problems, um, and other things that come up throughout the you know, lifetime of a forest manager. Beyond that, the financial benefits that we provide also can stimulate your communities, right? The more money in our pockets, the more we can support local businesses, local organizations, uh, families, neighbors. So that financial benefit does have a trickle down effect into the folks and the communities around you. Um, and healthier forests mean improved ecosystems, right? So it's not just humans that benefit from this program, our plant and animal friends, our ecosystems, our water, our air, the whole landscape is going to improve when our forest's health improves. So with that, um, again, if you have any questions on my part, please drop them in the chat now, but I'm gonna pass it over to our senior forestry manager, Ian Forte, to talk about our enrolled landowners and our eligibility. So Ian, take it away. Thank you, Scott. So, you know, like Scott mentioned, I'm Ian Forte. I am the senior forestry manager for Appalachia region. Uh, so this is Pennsylvania, uh, West Virginia, Maryland, now Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, and then soon to come uh, a few other states, which we'll go into a little bit here. <clears throat> so who we enroll? Um, landers that we're enrolling. Uh, so we're at about 600 landers, just over that right now, uh, with over 80,000 acres currently enrolled. We have already set aside $19.6 million in payments to our landowners. Like Scott mentioned before, these are guaranteed payments to you, so they'll never uh, go away. And they always have the potential to increase if the carbon market skyrockets. Um, right now, our satisfaction rate with our enrolled landowners is at 90%. Really, really high. We're really proud of that number, and we're excited to continue our engagement with these enrolled landowners. Uh, so... Where do we enroll? Uh, like I said, Appalachia, we're in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Maryland, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama. We do have uh, an expansion coming up here in a couple days. So we're going to be including Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia within that Appalachia region. Beyond Appalachia, we have two other regions. We have the Northeast and we have the Midwest. And you can see these states listed below there. Uh, so pretty exciting. We're expanding pretty far across the United States. And, you know, back in 2020, we started just in Pennsylvania alone, 16 counties in Pennsylvania, and it just, you know, took off from there. So really proud of what we've done so far. So our landowner goals uh, with our force, what are we seeing right now? So 61% of our enrolled landers do have some sort of prescribed harvest outlined in their forest management plan. Now, this should be taken as a special note. A lot of other carbon programs don't allow you to harvest. We do. We do have some stipulations, which I'll go over here in a little bit, but you know, we want to make sure uh, harvesting is some type of prescribed management for your forest if it's needed. We don't want to take that away from landowners. Now, we're not going to force it on you either, but again, we want to make sure you're able to. So, like I said, 61% of our enrolled landowners do have some sort of prescribed harvest outlined in their forest management plan. 77% of those uh, harvests that are outlined in the plans are commercial grade, uh, with 4% of our enrollees currently conducting a harvest right now as we speak. Uh, so most of the land is going to be recreational and hunting. Uh, not always the case, but most of our landers do utilize their forest for these for these um, these short term goals. And then most plan to keep their lands in their family, pass it on down to the future generations, which I will highlight a little bit later. So Susan, Susan is one of our Pennsylvania enrollees. Uh, she was an early adopter. Uh, you know, she was really just looking for a way to promote wildlife within our forest. So increasing the wildlife management activities, uh, maintaining the habits, the habitats that's currently there on site, but looking for an opportunity to fund these, uh, these management strategies. So she came to FSCP, uh, enrolled with us. And then, you know, we not only offer her, you know, a revenue source, an additional revenue source for her forest to help with these management strategies, but also expert advice. Uh, so, you know, Susan's been working really closely with her forester over the last couple of years, uh, really implementing a lot of different strategies that she wasn't 
previously aware of. Uh, so Susan's great, a really active, engaged forest landowner, um, sort of like a model landowner we like to see, but uh, not everyone has to fit that bill. So eligibility, what are we looking at? We're looking at 30 forested acres. They don't have to be contiguous forested acres, but they do have to be 30 of them at least. Uh, we do make some exceptions. If you're coming into our pipeline with, you know, about 31 acres, we have to remove a couple of those acres, you know, depending on the landowner's goals, the forest conditions, we will make some small exceptions, not too much. We still try to look for that 30 forested acres minimally. Uh, we don't like to see any kind of restriction on uh, timber harvesting activities on the property. Again, you don't have to do a harvest, but you need to be able to um, to do a harvest. So if there's some type of easement, local ordinance, something like that, that's going to outright restrict a harvest, it might not be the best fit for you. We don't enroll uh, folks that are in some sort of other forest carbon program with the exception of NCX. So many of you might be familiar with NCX. It was another carbon program. It was a year-to-year -year, uh, lease of the property to NCX, and they stopped uh, enrolling folks. So a lot of those have expired already. So we are you know, making an exception for those. But if you are a previous NCX participant, just you know, have your paperwork ready for us. We'll review it just to make sure it's a good fit for us. So growing mature forest, that is our improved forest management practice in the region. Uh, it's a 20-year contract, 30 forest acres, like I mentioned before. We do look for a minimum volume of 4,000 board feet per acre, which we don't expect you to, to know off, offhand or to calculate on your own. We will do that for you. Uh, we are looking for naturally occurring hardwood forest. We will make some exceptions on uh, conifer stands if they're you know, embedded within the forest structure but you know there is you know a 25 acre cap on that and it does have to be embedded it can't be along the edges something like that we don't allow for clear cutting within the practice we don't allow for high grading either um, which i'll talk a little bit more about that later uh, we do allow for sustainable harvesting and we do give you a yearly personal use allowance you can see the breakdown chart here below, but it's five uh, cords, the first 200 acres you can rule, and that's every year. And then additional five cords for every additional 100 acres you can rule with a 25 cord maximum. Um, and then like uh, Scott mentioned before, we do offer forest management plans for all of our enrolled woodlands. Uh, so this is one for every 10 years of the program, and I'll dive a little bit more into that next. So eligible counties, this is the map of our Appalachia region. Uh, you see the four new states here along the eastern edge, but uh, all of Pennsylvania, all of West Virginia, all of Tennessee, all of Kentucky, and then we have uh, specific counties we outline in Ohio, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. If you're interested in knowing which counties um, that are eligible in your state, please reach out. We can give you a full list of that. So forest management plans, two pathways for our landowners. We have our free uh, template plan that we will design for the landowner. It's uh, done by one of our staff foresters or one of the consultant foresters that we uh, employ. So we want to focus on those achievable objectives. So, you know, a lot of our landowners are new to forest management. We don't expect you to know everything, but, you know, we want, we want to engage you. And so we'll get you connected with either a local forester, uh, consultant forester that we work with, or we'll connect to connect you to one of our you know close staff foresters to your location. Figure out your goals, walk the forest with you, look for you know health concerns, invasive plant species, pests, that sort of stuff. Uh, really kind of model out what you expect to see your forest in the next you know twenty years to come. Um, so that first FMP, the first forest management plan, is probably going to be more of a, a, a sort of like a, a slow Kickstarter for you. We don't want to throw a whole bunch of different management strategies at you all at once. We want to get you, you know, dipping your toes in a little bit, you know, getting some achievable stuff worked on. So this will be, you know, maybe treating some you know, invasive plants along your paths, you know, whatever the case might be. 
Second pathway is a stipend paid to you. And you can see the payment chart right here. And this is based on your force acres, not just what you're enrolling with us, which is a nice um, nice thing to have. So if you're enrolling 100 acres with us, but you have 200 acres, we will write the plan for the entire 200 acres. Uh, so this is going to be typical if you're going to be enrolling in an NRCS type program where they need a CAP 106 plan. It's a little bit more in depth than what our template plan dives into. They want a lot more quantitative data, uh, so we will pay to help offset those costs for you. And if, if you don't have a forester you're working with, we will connect you with one of the consultant foresters in your area. Um, so don't fret. You know, we'll make sure you get this plan written. And you have two years to get that uh, written, too, before uh, Jasmine starts uh, knocking on your door there. But, uh, yeah, so you know, this is to be utilized as a guide. Uh, for you you know we don't force you into any kind of management strategy anything you're uncomfortable with uh, it, you utilize it as a guide we want to encourage you to work it as much as you can but we don't force it on you and you don't have to meet any kind of set goals or set expectations with our forest management plan so easements easements are always a big question uh, we do work really well with many easements the big thing we want to look for is that restriction on harvesting. Uh, if it's an outright ban on it, we don't work with that easement. But if there's some wiggle room for us in there, we will review it in-house for free for you. Just hand, you know, send us over the documents. We'll review the contract terms. Make sure that our contract works with you know the easement, but also the easement works with us. Uh, we're not going to try to lock you up into anything that's going to you know, cause a breach in our contract or, or your easement contract. Um, utility right-of-ways, gas line right-of-ways, these are pretty common. A lot of you know folks don't have these uh, easements on hand. Uh, they're usually you know very old. They're built with uh, you know into the deeded acres. If you don't go to the county records office, you might not be aware of them. Um, but we always ask you to, to try to dig that up. Some of them are undeveloped, and we will want to cut those out of the project area so there isn't any issues later on down the road. Um, but ideally speaking, if we see the utility right away, we'll just kind of cut it out of the, of the project area and continue on. So exclusions, great little stepping point from there. So we want to ensure that the project area that you're enrolling is going to be, um, you know, meet our minimum requirements, but also allows you to continue on with your forest um, as per usual. So, you know, buildings, we want to cut those out. We want to make sure you're not restricted uh, when you're expanding your, your, your house area, your yard. So we will create a buffer for you. Plantation. So these are planted trees that are larger than five acres in size. We will cut them out. Um, these tend to have a, a carbon loss for us. They're overcrowded a lot of the times, and you will see trees die off. So we want to ensure that we're not seeing a carbon loss with these plantations. So we'll, we'll cut them out of the project area. Um, like I mentioned, gas wells, we'll, we'll cut out food plots, roads, yards, all that. We'll just kind of cut out so you can continue on. Um, understocked areas. This comes up a lot. So you know, we do have that 4,000 board feet per acre minimum in volume that we look for. If you have a pocket within your forest that doesn't quite meet that volume requirement, if it's smaller than five acres in size, we're going to include it. If it's embedded in the forest, we'll include it. If it's on the edges, we'll exclude it. Um, so we can create these little stands, pocket stands, up to 25 total acres as long as they're less than five acres in size individually. Future sites, if you know you, you want to build a cabin, you want to build a road, you want to develop a food plot, some are within your forested acres, let us know. We'll map it out. We'll cut it out. We want to make sure our contract uh, restrictions aren't going to hinder this process for you. So you'll be able to clear out that forest path, that, you know, that, that new building site you're looking forward to, you're retiring on, whatever the case might be without interfering with our harsh restrictions. Um, and of course, any kind of non-forced areas, you know, large rivers, fields, ponds, we'll cut out. This also includes easements that have a restriction on riparian zones. Maybe they don't have an outright restriction on harvesting, but they do have it on a riparian zone area. 
And we'll just cut that out. We'll continue on with the other forested areas and ensuring that we're not going to interfere with that easement. So the personal use allowance. So I did talk about this a little bit here. So you already understand how many cords you have for you know, every year, five cords per year. Uh, this is going to be self-reporting to us every five years. Uh, just you know, take make a note what you you know what you removed from the forest system uh, in terms of cordage. If you don't know how to calculate the cordage, we do have a tool for you as well. A um, couple different ways that you can measure it. We'll want to make sure you're measuring it correctly. So there is no diameter limit on what you can cut on a fallen tree or a dead tree. We do want to ensure that fallen trees, dead trees, um, beyond that five you know, cords per year is left in the forest uh, for other ecosystem benefits as, uh, along with nutrient recycling. So we don't want to see, you know, complete cleaning up of the forest, um, you know, of debris. Uh, that would be more of a maintained area. So want to ensure that uh, as, as much as possible. If you're looking to you know, remove a, a standing live tree, they have to be lower than 12 inches in diameter. Anything 12 inches and above is going to be considered merchantable timber. So you want 11 inches and below. Um, again, if you don't know how to measure that, we'll help you ensure that you do. Now, this allowance can be used to sell firewood. Uh, this is a, a relatively recent change to our contract. We listened to the stakeholder feedback. Uh, we implemented this change to ensure that landers are able to utilize their personal allowance to sell firewood for you know local campsites, wherever the case might be, but also you know trading it with your neighbor, you know, um, bartering it out for something else. Um, but yeah, you know, use this personal allowance to create you know boards for your your next project, um, you know, fuel your home, whatever you want to do. So substantial harvest, this is going to be your typical harvest sell, uh, your timber harvest sell. Um, we do have an allowance for you. It's up to 25% of the total basal area that's enrolled, not the unenrolled areas. The unenrolled areas you're able to harvest uh, as you see fit. Um, so you do have to hire a qualified third-party forester. It uh, has to be someone outside of an organization Um just so there's no bias going on there. Uh, they will do a pre and post harvest report for us and we'll work with them to make sure the harvest stays within your contract terms. Um, we don't allow you to remove more than 10% of the average diameters of the trees. This reduces the, uh, the high grading activities. So we don't want to see just the largest trees, just the best trees being removed you want to make sure you have you know variable size classes as you know also species um and you can't harvest in a manner that's going to be contradictory to your state's best management practices uh, if you're not familiar with them I encourage you to look it up or you can reach out to us and we can get you a copy but every state's going to have a best management practice you know, in, re in regards to forestry what they want to see uh, in the forest system um, this could be stream crossing, making sure that not, no one's interrupting the stream flow. Also, you know, running it up, drainage issues, that sort of stuff. Uh, so, you know, be aware of them. And if you're not, come to us and we'll make sure you are. So, Tim Stout, another one of our rural landowners. So, this was a uh, one of our early Northeast landowners. Um, Primary concern was really just ensuring that you know, their force was, you know, left to their kids and their grandkids in, in a healthy and productive manner. Uh, so, you know, not just productive in terms of, you know, carbon storing, uh, carbon capturing, but also timber, uh, you know, just, just value the timbers that's going to be left there. Uh, diversity, uh, you know, making sure there's a lot of different, you know, species left uh, for the you know, future kids, the future owners of the forest. Uh, so that's uh, sort of goes into our legacy plan that we like to achieve with our landowners, really diving into the forest and seeing what your long-term goals are for not just you, but for your family, for the future. Uh, so, you know, he reached out to, you know, FSCP. We were able to get him enrolled, it's been working closely with our foresters to ensure those goals are met. So, you know, great, great participants. Uh, 
really doing a lot for the climate, but also at the forest level. And that does it for me. We'll pass off to Jasmine, and she'll dive into the uh, payments and landowners. You're on mute there, Jasmine. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> I was already so into it. I was just going to say that Tim Stell actually believed in the mission and goal so much of the program that he joined our board. So he's actually a board member, too. But as Ian was saying, I'm Jasmine Brown. I am the senior forestry or senior landowner stewardship manager, and um, I'll be talking about payments to landowners and what the next steps are that you can follow. And so the Family Forest Carbon Program, as you've heard already, provides forest family owners with both resources and payments to manage their lands um, to help them implement climate-friendly sustainable practices that'll really help their forest to grow more resilient. Um, we are currently offering 20-year terms and the payment for that term for our traditional plan um, is $230 per acre, and that is for our growing mature forest um, practice that we're talking about today. Payment amounts are really determined by the eligible acres that you have and then the rate per practice that we're offering. And our project data was really collected by our FFCEP foresters and then determined by our science team. So we have two different offers that we are offering right now. Um, one is that traditional plan, and then the other is the premium offer, which will provide 20% more in payments over your 20 year contract. And we'll get into more about that in just a second. Um, and then earlier you heard Ian and I think Scott both talk about how a part of our pro program is that you get a forest management plan. And so, excuse me, you are offered a stipend if you need an upgraded plan or, <laughs> excuse me, or if you um, don't already have a plan. And so that is based on the forested acres. Your contracts are always sent to you to be specified um, um, with specific payments, and then we will also send those to the landowner for your consideration. The forester surveys the property, um, and that's how we determine the payments as well. Um, and you receive that offer, and you receive that offer about 30 days, that's how long you have to consider it. And then our enrollment process takes from start to finish about 80 days. Okay, so the two different offers. Our premium offer, really um, you get 20% more over your total contract period. And in the first year you're receiving 20%. In the second year you're receiving 13%. In the third year, you're receiving 13%. In the fourth year, you're receiving 3%. In years five through nine, you're receiving 2%. In years two, 10 through 14, you're receiving 3%. In years 15 through 18, you're receiving 4%. And then in years 19 through 20, you're receiving 5%. So really, you're getting paid 46% um, up front within the first three years of enrolling. And then our traditional offer is a little bit different where you're receiving 26% paid per um, the, in the first three years. And so in that first year, you'll get 20%. In the second year through the eighth year, you'll get 3%. In the years nine through 14, you will get 4%. And then in years 15 through 19, you'll get 5%. And then finishing out in that last year, you'll get 10%. And so the offers are a bit different. And so for the premium payment, you're getting 276 per acre over the 20 year contract. And then um, your traditional payment is 230, like we were saying before. Um, both are great offers. Both you will receive, you'll receive one or the other um, from our account manager, and we'll dive into that a little bit um, later. But it's just important that you know there are two different offers that we're offering currently. Ooh, thank you guys. Bear with me. Um, my throat is doing all the things. But how do you actually like start the process? And most of you will already know because you're probably in the pipeline for, but for those of you who don't know, um, if you want to get started, you go to our website at www.familyforest.org. You will be able to find your specific property on the website mapping tool that we use. And so landowners can use that to 
utilize the check your availability mapping tool, and that's how you will start the qualification process. Um, you will then speak with one of our representatives about program specifics. So an FFCP contact center, they're really great. They'll reach out to you and confirm basic eligibility. Um, excuse me, then our FFCP account manager will provide further information and collect information from you about your land. So what are your goals? How long have you had it? What are your plans for it? That way we make sure that your goals for your land really align with our program as well. The next thing will be to connect you with a forester and whether that's virtually or on your property, Usually if you have over 500 acres, that's something that will come out and do on your property. But if you have less than 500, then that'll be a virtual appointment as well. And your forester will dive into even more details and determine eligibility and start to plan where your FFCP project, project area might be, right? And then you'll get the opportunity to review and you know if you're still interested, sign your contract. So once that project plan has been written by your forester, the FFCP account manager will deliver that offer, and then the final contract will be for review. And then that's where you get the 30 days to review that contract. And it's like, oh, yeah, I love the contract. Let's go ahead and sign it. And so if you decide that you want to sign the contract, then we'll start working on um, getting you your first payment. A part of that first payment is filling out all the paperwork that is required. Um, and so... Um, additionally, like after you sign, you will be connected to a community. And that's the team that I am on the community stand engagement team. And really our goal is to support you after you have signed your contract. So whether that's getting your management plan, getting connected with the forester, whether that is questions about the contract, what you can cut, what you can cut, we are there to help you, support you, and connect you with the rest of the community for events and educations. So lots of great things once you've signed your contract. But back to the forest management plans, um, we do hook you up with a forester to help you um, get that started. So regardless if you've already had one or if you need a new one or if you need a more in-depth one, um, like we said, there's either stipends or we can get you hooked up with a staff forester. So that's really how the process works of joining the Family Forest Carbon Program and getting enrolled in our program. So what are the next steps and how do you learn more? So if you are interested in learning more or if you know somebody who is interested in learning more, um, I recommend that you go to the familyforestcarbon.com backslash how it works backslash and you can find even more details. If you're like, hey, you should check your availability or eligibility for um, one of your neighbors or yourself, um, same thing, go to familyforest.org and backslash get started. But what are your next steps specifically after this webinar? If you are interested in scheduling a call with one of our account managers who is there to walk you through the entire process, um, we want you to go and click in your personal Woodland report, which can either be found in your webinar invitation or in your FFCP qualification notification notification email that you received when you first checked your eligibility. So two different ways which you could do that. And then you can also, for more specific questions that you might have that we're not able to answer on this webinar, um, I would encourage you, this is no obligation, you'll get one-on-one -on -one time, to give someone from our FFCP team a call, right? And that number is here at the bottom of the screen, the 844-790-0045, or you can even email us at info at familyforestimpact.org. So lots of ways to stay connected, lots of ways to continue the conversation or to get started with your enrollment in the process or even finish your enrollment in the process. Maybe this webinar has you really, really excited and you're like, I want to hear more immediately and I want to sign immediately as well. Um, we would love that. And so make sure that you are reaching out to us and you will also get um, another email after this. A webinar with the recording and the next steps as well, just in case you're like, oh man, Jasmine, I forgot who to call or I forgot who to contact or I forgot what to do. You will have all this information. So we are going to take this time now to open it up. Oh, I forgot Susan, uh, Miss Louise Hartman. She's so wonderful. This is a landowner that I have the pleasure of working with pretty often. Honestly, all the landowners that you've seen, I have the pleasure of working with pretty often. Um, and so I just wanted to read a quote from her that says, we are so glad to have found the Family Forest Carbon Program. 
The plan they created for us is so comprehensive in how it addresses the forest, invasive species, the quality and quali quantity of trees, wildlife, water quality, and how it helps the planet and climate change. I am so thankful that we were able to become part of it. And we are so grateful for you, Ms. Hartman. Um, so yeah, so let's get started with our q and I'm seeing a couple of questions already. Um, the first one I'm seeing is any thoughts on interaction with harvesting permissible conservation easements? And I will let our team take a stab at that question. So, well, yeah, like I mentioned before, um, you know, a harvesting permissible conservation easement we work very well with. Uh, we'll want to review it just to make sure uh, nothing sort of comes up as a, a little bit of a hiccup. But um, yeah, you know, it, if, if as long as it's allowing a harvest, we can oftentimes work really well with it. Uh, if you have something a little bit more specific you were, you know, worried about there, just, you know, let us know. Um, Scott, any thoughts on that? No, I think, you know, I'm glad you took that one. Um, the only thing I would note, again, is just to reiterate that we don't require harvesting. So um, just because your conservation easement permits it, and that's the reason it's uh, um, compatible with us, does not mean you need to, to harvest. And we would not um, require or encourage you to harvest. Uh, we just, in order to prove a carbon benefit for our program, we need there to have been a possibility of a harvest being conducted. Um, so yeah, nonetheless, I think you nailed it, Ian, we can work with it. And the best thing to do in that case, if you're curious or want to learn more is to engage with us, share a copy of that easement and have our team review that to confirm, uh, compatibility. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, here's a question in, uh, the chat that I'm going to, I feel like we could probably answer it live, but I also want to recommend this person give us a call because this is a question that I think is going to have a more in-depth answer. Um, so if the carbon markets go up substantially, you mentioned that FFCP would find a way to return the excess to participants. Has a structure been defined to say at what level of carbon price constitutes excess and what would percentage of the excess would the participants receive? If not, why can't you determine the details of how you would compensate participants? I can take a stab at this one, Jasmine. This is a great question. I've heard it before. So Jerry, thank you for it. Um, there's a few different kind of factors. First, I'll say we would we do intend to and would love to develop a mechanism for directly calculating when, what triggers that profit sharing and to what degree we would share that profit. Uh, there's a few reasons that's not in existence yet. Um, first and foremost, we're always trying to improve our contract. Uh, Ian mentioned earlier, we just changed our contract to allow the sale of our personal use allowance. Um, there's a lot of priorities to make our program better, to make the protections and allowances for our landowners better for you. Um, we have a pretty strong confidence currently that we're not going to see a major increase in carbon value, at least in any very short amount of time. So we factored in, like I said, a 3% increase. We're pretty confident we'll stay within that realm for the next little while uh, while we're working on other improvements. Um, and another reason is that on the voluntary carbon market, there's a lot of variability in the structure of carbon credit agreements, which can make it sometimes challenging to compare apples to apples carbon value on the voluntary market. Regulatory markets are a little bit different in that respect, but in our market, um, both sellers and carbon buyers can dictate the terms of their agreements to a much higher degree, making it sometimes hard to know, to just say, what is the value of carbon right now? Um, so we definitely intend to, we don't have a great universally accepted carbon value index that we can use for the voluntary market right now. Um, but it's something that we certainly have on our, our list of priorities for future contract improvements. I know that's probably not a perfect answer. I wish I had a, a stronger one, but uh, that's the best I can say for now. And, and Jerry, if you have further questions or want to chat about it, I'd be happy to um, have one of our team members engage with you further and have a, a little bit more dialogue on that. Thanks, Scott. Great job. Um, next question. Can you please go back to the page with the payment by year and give an example with an actual number of acres to show what you mean? Is that 276 per 
acres over the course of 20 years, just not clear on that part. So yes, it is um, 276 acres um, over the course of the year, oh, over the period of the contract. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, but yes, here's the slide. And if Scott and Ian want to elaborate on a more specific example, I'd be okay with that too. Yeah, I, I like to use 100 acres as an example because the math's easy and that's not my strong suit. So um, let's say you have 100 eligible acres and you've signed your contract at the premium option at $276 per acre. The total contract value, not including a forest management plan stipend, so this is purely your annual payments, would be um, $27,600 over the course of the 20 year period. So let's look at um, years 19 and 20, right? 5%, you would get 5% of that $27,600 um, in each of those payments. So that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. It's a common point of confusion. So thank you. I don't know who it was, it was anonymous, but whomever it was, thank you for that question. Yep, and we'll just stay on this slide for another 30 seconds to digest that. I'll just add while we're digesting. Um, yeah. Your offer package will have all of this information, including year by year payment amounts. So, um, I want to make it clear, if you do decide to move forward, you're under no obligation to sign the contract until after you've received both your offer package and the agreement to read through. So if you decide to engage, you know, you'll be able to chat with our team, you'll be able to chat with our forester, you'll see your project plan, you'll see the offer, you'll see the contract. Then at that point would be a great time to make a final decision when you have all the facts in front of you. So it's no obligation at this point. And uh, yeah, if you decide to talk with us, it's more so so we can provide the best information to you so you can make a great decision for yourself. Thanks, Scott. All right, next question. If you have a conservation easement on the land and take the associated federal tax deduction, are you still eligible for this program? Why would it matter if there are timbering restrictions in the easement, if there were any, that would render the land not eligible for this program? Yeah, great question. Um, so if you're getting a tax deduction, you still qualify, you're still eligible. So we do work with uh, current use program, tax programs, forestry tax programs with a bunch of different states. Um, same thing with any kind of conservation easement. We'll review the terms of the contracts and make sure it fits with us. Um, so why does it matter if there is a timber restriction? So we need to prove additionality uh, in our modeling. Um, so you need to be allowed to harvest. It doesn't say you have to harvest, but you need that. If, if there is no chance that harvesting is ever going to occur, then there is no way for us to prove any sort of additionality within our carbon modeling. Um, so that's that's why we're concerned. Um, yeah, uh, I think that answers it. Uh, Scott, you might have something else. I, I just want to make sure additionality is clear. Um, so in the world of carbon programs, additionality is the number one most important thing to prove the integrity of the program. Basically what that means is you're going to have a baseline. If our program didn't exist, certain actions would happen in the next 20 years. Some portion of our enrolled landowners, if our program didn't exist, would harvest their property. Some would clear cut, some would high grade, some would sustainably harvest, some would leave it untouched. Imagine that as your baseline scenario. Now imagine a scenario where we do exist because our landowners are enrolling in our program, the portion of them that would have ended up harvesting to some degree, those behaviors will change because they've enrolled in our program. So the difference in the amount of carbon the forests would sequester or store in the baseline scenario would be different than the amount of carbon they would sequester or store in this real life scenario with our program. And the difference in those two carbon sequestration and storage degrees is the additionality of our program. It's the additional carbon that our program is either preventing from entering the atmosphere or removing from the atmosphere. And that's where the value, that's that difference is the amount of carbon that we're able to then create carbon credits with to sell into the market. So going back to the question around conservation easements, 
if a conservation easement says no tree will ever be cut down on this property, then the baseline scenario and the reality scenario are the same. There is no additional carbon impact. Um, so again, we're not going to encourage harvesting. We're not going to limit harvesting. Uh, we will limit, excuse me. We're not going to encourage or require it. Um, but we do need the possibility of it to be there at the beginning before our contract agreement is applied to that property. Thanks, Scott. Um, looks like there's another question. Are there other similar carbon programs available in Ohio or is your program totally unique? There are a host of other carbon programs. Um, they're not quite the same as ours. Uh, ours is pretty unique, especially since we do allow for harvesting uh, to occur. We also have a shorter contract. Uh, so those are those are real two very big differences. But you know, beyond that, um, it, it's our it's our foresters that we work with, making sure landers are engaging with uh, you know professionals. So a lot of the uh, other programs will sort of just enroll you. Um, you know, hope for the best, but uh, we really try to stay engaged with our landowners, uh, make sure they understand everything, and then again, allow you to harvest. Um, you know, as, as as much as you can within that that restriction. Yeah, and another thing I'll add is just that we are a nonprofit, so that makes us unique all in itself. Um, okay, so we're winding down on the questions. Does participation in this program require signing a timber deed? It does not. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the connection with the Nature Conservancy? Good question. So uh, I can take this or you can, Ian, but um, you can see the logos, American Forest Foundation and Nature Conservancy in the bottom right corner. So those are the two nonprofits that created FFCP. Um, AFF is mandated with operating the program. So everyone on this webinar who you can see is employed by the American Forest Foundation to operate the program. Uh, there's a lot more of us for the record. Um, the Nature Conservancy supports kind of the development and refinement on the science side of the program. They also, you know, use their network to expand the program and improve it, but largely they're, they're responsible for helping with modeling, making sure the structure of the program and the way that it's modeled and the way that it um, operates uh, works with the carbon programs, works with both of our missions, and uh, generally is just the following best practices for um, creating and improving a carbon program. And we do still work very closely with TNC to this day. I think we have one more, Jasmine, that we might have missed around durability of the agreement after land sale or death of the owner. Do you, you want to take that? I don't see that question. Can you ask it's it? It's in the more chat, time? not the oh, it's in the chat. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you, if, if, if unfortunately an owner dies or if the land um, gets sold, we have an entire enrollment team that you can work with to determine um, what happens with your land after. Um, the contract does run with the land though. And so we would wanna be in touch with the next owner or the next owner of the land um, to make sure that they are aware of the contract terms and eligibility agreements. Uh, but yeah, that's something that we have a plan and a process for, and we would work, it's very much on a case by case basis though. Perfect. I don't see any other questions. We do have about four minutes. So if there was something that was not answered or if something is jumping to mind right now that you want to put into the chat, um, we would love to take the this time to answer those additional questions. I think I saw one. 
Oh, saw that there was a 90% satisfied with the program. What types of issues have arisen with the other 10%? That's a really good question. Um, I could take that one because I usually work with landowners and hear what they're satisfied about and what they're not satisfied about. Um, it could be anything from that. Well, that's actually a really good question. <laughs> um, I would say the other 10% were not sure of what they were going to do with their land after they signed the contract. And so upon signing, they wanted to make some changes that we were just not aware of. And so probably communication issues would be the biggest thing that I feel like the 10% were not satisfied with. Um, but nothing with uh, how the program is working or that we have done something that we said we weren't going to do, I would just say it was about communication. Thanks for that question, though. One more in the chat. Where are we located? Um, tough question to answer, depending on how you uh, <laughs> approach it. So AFF, the foundation is based in Washington, D.C. Um, our employees are mostly remote. We have a few folks in the DC area, but mostly everywhere. I'm in Michigan myself. I think Ian's in Pennsylvania. Um, Jasmine, I actually don't know where you are. That happens a <laughs> lot in our organization. Oh, Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville. Yeah. So we have folks everywhere from um, New Hampshire to Oregon to Florida, all over the country working for AFF. Um, and Ian went over where we're active in terms of our program uh, eligibility. So mostly the eastern part of the United States from Maine over to Minnesota and then down through Appalachia to uh, some of the Gulf Coast states like Alabama, Georgia. So really the whole eastern third, I guess, of the United States where you see a lot of those hardwood forests. Now, we have staff foresters spread out pretty evenly across um, our region too. So, I think we have a we have a staff forester in, in Tennessee right now. We're looking to do a couple new hires in in uh, Virginia, North Carolina, a um, couple folks in Pennsylvania, a couple in West Virginia. We have a forester in in Ohio, yeah, Wisconsin, Michigan, just spread out pretty far and wide. So it looks like we have a minute left and I'm not seeing any questions, Ian and Scott, if I missed any, please let me know. Just wanted to encourage you all once again to follow the next steps. If we could go back to that slide, that would be great. Um, remember, this is no obligation, one-on-one -on -one time. Give us a call, 844-790-0045 or send us an email if you are already in our pipeline is what we call it and you've already received like uh, your personal Woodland report, you can always look in your webinar and click, click your qualification email as well to get a call scheduled and someone will reach out to you. Thank you guys so much for joining us today um, and we hope you have a wonderful day.